for the thousands of military men and women who serve as members of precision drill teams and other ceremonial units, looking sharp is a way of life. They're the ones most often in the public eye. The ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. It's a role that drives a need for attention to every detail. We represent the entire military. It's countless number of hours outside, 24 hour work day, sleepy hours at two o'clock in the morning. Things that we do so that we, we can be the best and, and represent the country to, the, to, our, to our best. The metal pieces we actually spin on a jeweler's wheel. Our belts are custom made. Uh, this is one of the pieces of equipment that we keep on our rack, our equipment that we're wearing for the day. Something that very few people can say they do. To be honored enough to, to be able to be in the public eye. Uh, a lot of people when they come and visit the tomb of the Soldier, they're touring DC, they see all the sites and they come and see the tomb because it's on their tour brochure. Uh, and a lot of people, this is the only piece of military that they actually see. When they come here and they see a soldier in uniform, they look at us representing the rest of the military and they see a direct reflection of what the military is. It's understandable why the spit-shined, sharply creased image the old guard presents to the public is important. But the work most service members do every day happens without an audience. So why should concerns about image matter to them? While the choice of words varied, the answers we got from military men and women around the world all had one ideal in common. When someone does something in a uniform, it's not just a reflection on that person. It's a reflection on every military service. You're representing your country. So due to that, you must have a good representation because it's not only for yourself. Like your appearance is pretty much everything in the military. First, the way you look, the way you act, and everything like that. You know, it starts with the outside looks, and then from then on, it's, you know, courtesies, being professional, being nice to people. So the people that you know, you, you're trained for this, that you're uh, ready to fight, and that you're, uh, uh, you're diligent in what you're doing. It's more than your looks, whether your boots are shined or your uniform is pressed. It's about your confidence and your way you present yourself to people. And that's the perception they're going to get off of you, whether we're professional or we don't care about the way we look. We don't care about the way we look. Do we care about the way we perform our job? You know, we always take pride in what you do. Appearance plays a big role in how others perceive you. For military men and women, service regulations focus on much more than just wearing a uniform the right way. How you fit in your uniform how you cut your hair, the amount and type of jewelry you can wear. There are specific rules for each. Still, when one of those standards isn't met, it's usually an easy fix. But what happens when a tattoo doesn't meet standards? What are the rules? And are there possible career consequences? With the increased popularity and acceptance of tattoos in American society, more military men and women are seeking answers to those questions than ever before. Among those who serve in the U.S. military, tattoos are nothing new. In fact, historical records tell us Navy sailors were among the first groups of Americans known to get them. The U.S. Navy, especially in the Pacific, had been there many, many years, and they had taken tattooing from other navies and civilian sailors. Case in point, Chief Petty Officer Frederick Wilson, who served with the Asiatic Squadron from 1899 through 1901 and kept a log describing his travels. Frederick loved getting tattooed. He loved it. He thought it was an art form. He wasn't ashamed about it at all. He, and he loved traveling from port to port, and this was his souvenir that he picked up. He's more vocal about the tattoos and what they mean to the sailors and it's a competition on board the ships but the impression that I get is that when you leave the ship you know that sort of culture isn't discussed in port towns and church suppers 
In 1908, Navy Surgeon Amon Fahrenholt examined the personnel records of nearly 3,600 men who had enlisted or re-enlisted on board the Navy training ship Independence during the preceding eight and a half years. He discovered some 23% of first-time enlistees already had one or more tattoos. As for those who had re-enlisted one or more times, Dr. Fahrenholt learned more than 53% had tattoos. Usually tattooing is when you have large wars and you have large numbers of very young sailors. I wasn't full grown yet. <laughs> that was exactly the story for Lloyd Brown, who was only 16 when he served with the Navy during World War I. Yes, that's New Hampshire, so it's supposed to be. It's kind of faded a little bit. <laughs> Lloyd Brown was the last known U.S. Navy veteran of the First World War. He passed away March 29, 2007, at the age of 105. During the Second World War, the Navy was three million strong, and tattoo parlors were a common sight along the East and West Coasts, particularly in port towns. Meanwhile, advertisements from major companies such as Coca-Cola and Marlboro reflected the times. Fast forward to 1982 and the release of the movie An Officer and a Gentleman. In the opening scene of the movie, the central character, Zach Mayo, is telling his father, a retired Navy enlisted man, that he's going to go to officer training. He's going to be a naval aviator. <laughs> Great stuff. Look at yourself. His father points to his tattoo and says, Officers don't have tattoos. Which is generally true. But the subtle message that his father was telling us is that you're trying to be something that you're not. You get this mail? Subic face, Philippine, sir. Ah, I to recognize the word. In the end, Zach Mayo achieves his dream. Congratulations, Ensign Mayo. In a time when more Americans have tattoos than ever before, it's not surprising the military services would be affected, though they all agree tattoos must never be extremist, indecent, sexist, or racist in nature. Each service has a different take on what is acceptable. In March 2006, the Army announced it would allow tattoos on the hands and back of the neck. However, any tattoos on hands must be small and unobtrusive, and those on the back of necks can't be visible above uniform collars. When explaining the change, the Army cited a survey that found 28% of Americans under the age of 25 have at least one tattoo. That number jumps to 30% for ages 25 to 34. And within those groups are thousands of otherwise qualified men and women the Army had to turn away because of the location of their tattoos. It was an added limitation on an increasingly limited resource. It most definitely is a challenging market for all branches, not even just the Army. However, uh, the, the media portrays that there is a lack of interest in joining the military. The interest is there. It's not there's a lack of interest to join there's a lack of qualified individuals that can join. One year after the Army changes, oh, yeah. the Marine Corps decided to make the first adjustment to its 42-year-old tattoo policy by further limiting the kinds of tattoos it would allow. And the type known as sleeve tattoos, which cover the majority of a person's arm or leg, didn't make the cut. The concern, I think, that, that we have as an institution is for what uh, we would call excessive tattooing, which then starts at some point not to present a, a good military appearance. Now, does a tattoo keep a Marine from doing his job, his or her job? Absolutely not. Uh, and we realize that. But a Marine really restricts uh, his possible assignment uh, if you have excessive tattoos. Air Force policy summed up says tattoos can't cover more than 25% of an exposed body part and must not be visible at all above the collar. Meanwhile, a sailor's tattoos can't show through the white uniform or beyond the head, face, or neck. And if on the lower arm, a tattoo can't be any larger than the wearer's fist. As for the Coast Guard, tattoos on the face, head, neck, and hands are off limits. 
and no more than a quarter of arms or legs can be tattooed. So why do U.S. servicemen and women get tattoos? Is it because they think it's the in thing to do, or because they're patriots, or because they want a reminder of loved ones or lost friends? Well, yes. The fact is, there are as many reasons as there are people. And the same holds true for the varied views people have about tattoos. When people in the military get it, I think it has some sort of deeper meaning. I mean, tattoos are pretty much a tradition for all military. So, I mean, everybody normally gets one here at, at least one time in a naval career. I feel that it's something that people should refrain from until they're out of the service or to put it in places where it can't be seen in uniform. I feel the tattoos are a personal thing. But the way the regulations have changed, how you can have tattoos on your neck and your hand, I think it hinders performance in the Army. It makes me a little bit more prouder that I am in the military, showing that, hey, I have this uh, tattoo and it's got the Air Force symbol in it, and I'm proud of it. Some people think that they're like a bad thing. I, I think they're kind of neat. For the most part, I feel that a as long as the tattoo is appropriate, that anyone should be able to have them. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't have them, but if you do have them, be smart about it. Especially when overseas, to me, I mean, these are pretty much the ambassadors of our country, so. Be careful where you put them and make sure they're artistic and not gross. Carrying on a family tradition of service in the U.S. Marine Corps these last four years, Lance Corporal Andrew Gray has learned firsthand that looking sharp is a big part of what it means to be a Marine. Oh, I mean, every day from, uh, you know, small unit leaders, team leaders, squad leaders, uh, stuff like that, they're pushing that. I mean, even when we're out in the field, like out training in the woods, they're like, hey, you know, shave every day, double dog and stuff like this. They don't let it slide one bit. Andrew has served two tours in Iraq, on top of his memories, he also has one permanent reminder honoring friends lost in combat. They just didn't make it back, and I, you know, I, I was pretty close with both of them. I know they were definitely not the same, you know, for me. So that was like, as soon as it happened, I mean, after I got over it and we got home, I was like, that's definitely the first, you know, ink that I'm getting. It's just a reminder of everything that, you know, that I've been through. and. You know, you just look at it. If you're having like a tough day or whatever, I'll just look down and I'll be like, hey, well, nothing was as tough as when I went through that. Andrew didn't stop with one tattoo, but they all fall within current regulations. He says there's a personal payoff for meeting the Corps' demanding appearance standards. You know, when you know that you look good and you wear the uniform and stuff, you, you, you got to walk a little bit tall. You got you to stick your chest out a little bit. Regardless of which service a person signs up for, everyone who puts on the U.S. military uniform has to meet the same standards. That means reservists are expected to fit right in with their full-time counterparts. Also, those who serve a tour and then leave the military should keep in mind that eight-year service obligation everyone commits to when they join, because you just might get called. That's what happened to Ian Jones, who left the Army in 2003 after four years in the service. And then in 2005, I got a letter in the mail saying that I had to report back from the inactive reserves back to active duty. By that time, I had already had tattoos on my neck and my hands. And so I had to send in a, a memorandum to the Department of the Army with pictures of my tattoos to see if they still even wanted me to come back in. They said, no, thank you. So you put the stencil on, you can go look in the mirror and make sure you get like, exactly where it is. This part's temporary, the next part's forever. Individual opinion aside, it's a fact that tattoos are a common sight these days and no longer just among fringe groups and the young. An American Academy of Dermatology study claims almost one in four Americans between 18 and 50 have a tattoo. At the same time, there's a better understanding of related health risks and improvements in tattooing procedures. Still, not every tattoo parlor or artist is up to speed. If you do choose to get a tattoo, in addition to your services regulations, there are some other things you should look for and consider. The shop, look around, is it dirty, is it clean? 
Are they using bags over like the part they're gonna touch? Is everything in a clean environment? You know, new needles. You don't want to go get a tattoo right before you're gonna go to the field for a month. And if you're pregnant, could be pregnant, you don't want to get tattooed. Anyone can get a tattoo gun and a tattoo machine and run out and start tattooing their buddies. And when I was in Fort Hood tattooing, we had quite a few that had came back and uh, they were getting tattooed out in Iraq. And, uh, they, I mean, it just didn't look good, mainly because of the quality of the artist. But even then, like, I wouldn't want a tattoo in Iraq because just too much risk for infection and sickness because it's, in essence, it's an open wound and you're trying to heal it in a not-so-clean place. More people with tattoos also means there are more who wish to have one removed. That study, done by the American Academy of Dermatology we mentioned earlier, also indicated of the 24% of Americans who have tattoos, about 17% have given thought to having one removed. At Walter Reed Army Medical Center's Dermatology Clinic, Dr. Kurt Maggio has been performing laser removal of tattoos since 2000. Hello, hey, good to see you again. How are things? Good, sir. Okay, so we're ready to do... This hour, session, his patient huh? is Ensign You're Charlie Solis, back for his 10th session. Sessions. Okay, yes, I know that you've been through quite a few of these uh, removal sessions, right? Yes, sir. Great, okay. Let's just kind of take a look at how we're doing. I got this tattoo when I was much younger. I've grown up and it, it's pretty much stayed the same, so... Now that I'm in the, the healthcare profession, um, when patients come in, they kind of look you up and down and that first impression, and then when they see the tattoo, you know, every now and then you can see a, a kind of uh, reaction that lets you know that it's not the first impression you'd want to make, I guess. All right. Well, let's both get our goggles on and have at it. Dr. Maggio says it takes about 10 sessions to remove most tattoos spread out over a one to two year period. And he cautions it's far from pain free. Black India ink tattoos are the easiest to remove. Amateur tattoos are much easier to remove than professional tattoos. There is less density and less overall ink. It hurts. It definitely hurts more. I've always found that tattoo laser removal is far more painful, expensive, and tedious than physically getting the tattoo. Now, as the laser beam travels over the tattoo, what is physically happening is that the laser beam is shattering the pigment into smaller particles, and the smaller particles can be uh, removed by the body from the skin. This same technology is also used on patients recovering from what are referred to as traumatic tattoos, commonly seen with blast injuries. We remove lead pencil marks, radiation marks, and blast injuries with the same exact way. So that's the main reason why we have it in military facilities. For ink tattoos, removal is not cheap. The average cost runs from two to $500 per session. The military only foots the bill if the removal is command directed for not meeting standards. And then if there is a tattoo that is not an issue to good conduct and discipline and is on a covered surface such as the buttocks or stomach, they would have to be charged. All right, good to see you again today. Okay, see you again in a month or so. Dr. Maggio's next patient is also well into the removal process. Hello, nice to see you again. How are things going? As an aircraft maintenance technician, Master Sergeant Chris Carr had no idea his tattoos would ever be an issue. Then he was selected for a position working on VIP aircraft and learned he'd have to make some changes. In order for me to have my job that I have now, I have to have, I can't have any exposed tattoos from the short sleeve blue shirt. I think that uh, we need to use more of a red color laser on this one to, to really get a good treatment, okay? All right, we'll start over here and we'll commence. It's like getting hit with a rubber band, you know, but about 2,500 times. Today's session is Chris's 11th. I never thought 10 years ago I'd be doing the job I'm doing now, but 
If I'd have thought a little more then, I probably wouldn't have got it. Though there is pain, scarring is rarely an issue with this procedure. But there can be some pigment change, particularly for darker skins. Still, a big improvement over the past. The only other treatment that used to be used in the past was derm abrasion. That's where you would sand off the laser ink and create a new, unpleasant looking scar. And the other option you would have had is actually excising it with cold steel surgery. So are there patients who can't take the pain of laser removal? Yes, absolutely, and we've converted them to excision. So instead of doing this, we went ahead and excised the tattoo. All food for thought if you're thinking of getting a tattoo. Bottom line, there is no quick fix for tattoos people want or need removed. And for military men and women, the chance you might have to spend a considerable amount of your own hard-earned cash is very high. Well, unfortunately, I, I see people sort of after the fact, after they've gotten the tattoos and um, they wish to have them removed so, you know, very quickly and easily, and I wish it were an easier process to have it removed, but generally my advice on these tattoos, if you have to get a tattoo, you want to make it the smallest possible and in an area that you can selectively conceal. Not everyone in the military has a job like the old guard where they're constantly out in front of the public. So not everyone is expected to maintain the perfectly polished image. But as the saying goes, perception is reality. And for military men and women, that perception and how it affects image does matter.